It is an honor and a pleasure to have with us Dr. Valerie McLaughlin from the University of Michigan. Thank you for stopping by. I know it's been a busy conference for you. Tom, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to interact with you and, and share all the data that's been presented at this conference with the viewership. Dr. McLaughlin, let's talk about the session you moderated entitled Treatment of Pulmonary Hypertension. What were the most important takeaways from this session? Well, this session had a lot of key information about some different therapies that we use for PAH and some sort of background therapies that we've used for many years without data. Uh, so one of the presentations was on Massey-Tatin. It was a sub-analysis from the Serafin study, which was a large randomized placebo-controlled event-driven study. And this looked specifically at hospitalizations. And there was a significant reduction in the number of hospitalizations over the many year duration of the trial in patients who were randomized to Massey-Tatin versus those that were randomized to placebo. And this occurred in, in all the different groups. And it's really key data, especially as we think about patients' quality of life, staying outside of the hospital. When we think about pharmacoeconomics, the cost of hospitalizations is very high. So this was really a key sub-analysis from the Serafin study. What was your assessment on the results presented on Masitentan, Rioseguat, and Triprostinil? So there was some data presented on the extension from the Rioseguat trial in chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. So Rioseguat is a soluble guanate cyclase stimulator that has been FDA approved for both group one pulmonary arterial hypertension, but also for group four chronic thromboembolic disease. And it's the first drug ever that's been FDA approved for this subgroup, for, for this classification of chronic thromboembolic disease. So patients who either had disease that was too distal to be considered for a pulmonary endarterectomy, or patients who had persistent pulmonary hypertension after an endarterectomy were randomized into this trial. And the placebo-controlled data has already been published. But this trial looked at the longer-term outcomes in the open-label study. So patients who were formerly on placebo got treated with Rio Siguat, and these patients were followed. And again, there are limitations of such a trial that some patients may drop out and the like, but the patients who were followed seemed to have a durable effect of the drug. Their six-minute hall walk improvement was maintained. And the safety profile was very similar to what was seen over the course of the randomized controlled trial. The one safety aspect that had some discussion was hemoptysis. There were a couple events of hemoptysis. This was seen in the randomized controlled trials. These patients are obviously on war for an anticoagulation. So it's something that we need to keep our eye on, but otherwise the safety profile was consistent with what's been previously reported. There was also a study on oral traprostanol. Now, oral traprostanol has been studied in three randomized controlled trials. And in the trial on monotherapy, there was a statistically significant improvement in the primary endpoint of six-minute hall walk. But when the drug was used in combination with ERAs or PD-5s or both, there was not a statistically significant improvement in the hall walk at the time of the, the trial. Uh, the, the end of the randomized placebo control trial. This trial that was presented in the session was a little bit different. It looked at patients who were already on parenteral prostacyclins, parenteral traprostanol, either sub-Q or IV. And these were very carefully selected patients. They had functional class one or two symptoms, pretty good six-minute hall walk, cardiac index of greater than 2.2. So a, a group of patients that was doing well on IV or subcutaneous traprostanol. And as an inpatient, these patients were transitioned from either the IV or subcutaneous traprostanol to oral traprostanol. Most patients were in the hospital for a number of days, four or five days, and the transition was completed safely. And almost all of the patients, there were one or two that didn't complete the study. A repeat right heart cath showed uh, similar hemodynamics, although the mean pulmonary artery pressure was slightly higher, the cardiac index was slightly lower, hall walk was preserved, and they also did quality of life measures. And the quality of life um, on both of the, the therapies, IV sub-Q or oral, was, was preserved. It was very similar, meaning to me, it wasn't as much the IV sub-Q versus oral, but it was that the patient still felt good in terms of their pulmonary hypertension.
Uh, the median dose at the end of the transition was 51 milligrams, much, much higher than what we've seen in the randomized control trials. How do you currently use anticoagulants in your patients? And this is a really a critical question about anticoagulation because we use this based on small observational analyses suggesting a survival benefit in the patients with idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. So one of the studies presented was a very large, several thousand patient registry in Europe, the Compara registry. Most of the patients came from Germany. And what they did is looked at the survival in patients who are on anticoagulation versus not on anticoagulation. And in patients with group one, idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, it appeared as though anticoagulation conferred a survival benefit. The patients on anticoagulation lived longer than those who were not. When they looked at other subtypes, other associated pulmonary arterial hypertension, there was not the survival benefit. So that is an observation that is consistent with some of the other observations from decades ago. But then just after that, there was a second paper uh, discussed from the Reveal Registry, a large US-based registry, and they handled things a little differently. They selected some patients on anticoagulation and tried to match them up with, for patients, with patients with a similar risk profile that were not on anticoagulation to try to compare apples to apples. And what they found is that there was not a survival benefit either in the idiopathic or associated when they were matched based on risk. So I think we still have a lot of unanswered questions to anticoagulation. We think that maybe it is appropriate in patients with idiopathic PAH, and it does have a weak expert recommendation in the guidelines for that. But one of the discussion points after these two presentations was that perhaps the guidelines should be changed in terms of that weaker, weaker recommendation for anticoagulation in the associated. Perhaps we should not recommend it in the associated because there are now these two large observational trials that suggested there was no benefit at all. And there's certainly risk to anticoagulation. So I, I, th I think it's still not a clear situation in terms of what we do clinically. For idiopathic, I think that there are patients that we will continue to prescribe it for, uh, especially the more ill patients. But for the associated, the scleroderma patients who have a higher bleeding risk, it's clearly no benefit. I think I will be more reluctant to use anticoagulation for other associated types of pulmonary arterial hypertension. What are the most important findings from the Pharos Registry information and how will this inform practice? So Virginia Steen was here to present some very important data from the Pharos Registry, which is a scleroderma registry. And what she focused on for this meeting was restrictive lung disease. So many scleroderma patients have pulmonary arterial hypertension, that's group one. Many have restrictive lung disease, and many have pulmonary hypertension with restrictive lung disease, and sometimes it's hard to tease out whether that's group three related to their restrictive lung disease or whether it's group one pulmonary arterial hypertension. So she presented two posters, one in patients with restrictive lung disease and pulmonary hypertension that were treated with um, uh, mycophenolate mofetil, CELSEP, um, and showed that there was a bit better of an outcome in the patients who received that therapy. And the other poster looked at patients who received PAH-specific therapy or not. Uh, some patients weren't treated with any PAH-specific therapy, and perhaps their physicians thought they were more consistent with group three. Some patients received ERAs, some patients received PD-5 inhibitors. The main thing she was looking at was for a safety signal. One of the things we always worry about when we give non-selective vasodilators to patients with restrictive lung disease is worsening VQ mismatch. And there was no safety signal that was observed, but there was no major efficacy signal observed either. But of, of course, these were relatively small numbers. In your opinion, Dr. McLaughlin, what is the biggest trial and tribulation you're currently facing in PAH? Wow, that's a great question. You know, we know that there is uh, effect of many different drugs individually. We're learning more about combination therapy and you know, perhaps when to combine and if there are specific agents we should combine is an important question. But I think one of the nice uh, take home messages from the session was uh, in the, the summary that Marius Hooper did and he really highlighted some of the problems that we are going to have in randomized controlled trials in, in the future. So many patients are receiving 
commercial therapy and many patients come into trials on two or three therapies and so it's going to be harder and harder to test new drugs. We're going to need an incremental treatment benefit on top of what we have. Um, because it's getting harder to enroll patients into trials, there are patients that are going into trials who may not have exactly what we think of as group one pulmonary arterial hypertension. The age is going up, the body mass index is going up, there's a high number of concomitant illnesses, and sometimes we wonder if there aren't patients that are somewhat atypical that maybe have, you know, not really truly group one pulmonary arterial hypertension going into trials. Um, and just determining endpoints in trials. So there are six minute hall walk trials and we all want to know what a, some, a drug does functionally to a patient to a hall walk, but we really take care of our patients longer than 12 weeks or 16 weeks. So we want longer term outcomes trials. Now that's very hard for novel therapies. It's, it's hard for a drug company to invest money to do a big endpoint driven trial if they don't have that drug on the market. So one of the things that he opined could be the wave of the future is to get an initial approval based on six minute hall walk, but with then commitments to do longer term outcomes types of trials, which I think is a very reasonable compromise. Dr. McLaughlin, thank you for sharing your time and your insights with us. It's my pleasure, Tom. Thanks for having me.